Hey, my name is Randy. I'm one of the pastors here. We're in a series on uh, the book of First Corinthians. We've been going through that the last couple of weeks. Um, and I'm going to just maybe do a little bit of review, just like a little recap, and then we're going to get into some of the rest of this stuff today. But um, I'm going to show you a picture. Yeah, there it is. That works. So we have a picture here. This is a picture of uh, modern day. This is modern day, the city of Corinth, which is where you get Corinthians from, right? It's in Greece. So uh, this is obviously a little arena, a theater there. Pretty cool that it's still standing. But um, ancient writers back in the day, they considered Corinth in Greece. It was like rich and prosperous. It was always great and always wealthy. It was a prosperous city, but it was also known, as Pastor Eric said a couple weeks ago, it was known for its immorality. They actually made a name. like They, they developed a word in Greek about the Corinthians, and it was like Corinthian, Corinthianism I, which basically means like calling people like you're such a Corinthian because they were so immoral. They were so kind of messed up. They didn't really have like a, like a great moral compass there. As I was preparing for the message and I was looking through some commentaries, one of the comment, commentaries said that Corinth was like if you combine Los Angeles, New York City, and Las Vegas all into one, that would be like the equivalent to this ancient city of Corinth. Um, they, 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 it, was a, it was like a port city, which is which strategically and uh, on the map, that's where all like the trading ships would come and all the sailors would stop there and they would go into the city. So it was all kinds of, all kinds of stuff going on there back in the day. And um, Sin City, basically. Right? Anybody ever heard of that before? Like for Las Vegas? Is that what it is? Las Vegas is Sin City? I forget. Or is that New York City? It's Las Vegas, right? Sin City? Yeah. So it's kind of like Sin City. Uh, and Paul started that church right there in Sin City, if you will. He started the church. He laid the foundation. Pastor Eric was mentioning that. Laid the foundation. He plowed the road to Corinth. Before Paul was there, Corinth didn't have the gospel. They didn't know about Jesus. And Paul went there. He blazed the trail all the way to Corinth in Greece. And it was tough. Everywhere Paul went, he was facing oftentimes persecution and, and sometimes violent persecution. And he would go from city to city and he would lay the foundation of Jesus Christ and, and lay the gospel for the people. And he would lay that there and then he would move on. So he spent about a year and a half in this city right here. Maybe he actually spent some time in that very theater. I don't know. But he was in that city of Corinth for about a year and a half before he moved on. And because he blazed that trail, like after he had kind of plowed the road, other people came in behind him. So one of them was a guy named Apollos we've been talking about. He was a Christian. He's a good guy. He like helped to build the church. So he came in there and built on the foundation that Paul had laid. But then later on, other people came into the city and they were actually false teachers. They were teaching like false gospel, false Jesus stuff. They were interested in getting the people's money, right? That doesn't happen nowadays, does it in church? I hope not, right? But it's true. It's true. It's the same issue. Some of the same issues from thousands of years ago still sometimes happen today. And that was one of the things that happened back then in Corinth. It's like, it's like people came into the city after Paul and they tried to take advantage of the fact of the church and they tried to get authority and power and money. So Paul was having all kinds of problems here at Corinth. Even though he had moved on, he still maintains contact. So he had somebody show up and, and they, they came to tell him about what was going on back here in Corinth. And it was a mess. It was a mess. He had spent a year and a half of his life there, but now he knows like, hey, there's divisions that are ripping this church apart. Like we need you to know, Paul, that this church that you planted here is just, is just they're at each other's throats. And they were, they were so immature. They were splitting over, over silly stuff. Like some people would be like, oh, I, I, Paul, Paul's not a great speaker, right? Like Paul, Paul doesn't have like the flash and the, and the pop that we want from a speaker. Paul, Paul well, he's not really my guy, but this guy, Apollos, this other preacher guy, that's my guy. I belong to Apollos. And other people would be like, well, I belong to Paul. And then other people be like, well, I belong to Peter. And as silly as it sounds, there was like this immaturity where people were like dividing with each other in the church over what preacher that they liked best and who they wanted to follow. Not only was it that that was dividing the church up, but they were, the, this book actually talks about they were suing each other. There's people suing each other inside the church. There were people sleeping around with each other inside the church. There were people listening and supporting false teachers, as I said before, inside the church. They were going to pagan temples still, and all along the way, they're totally proud. They think that they're super spiritual, superior Christians. They've got it all together kind of Christians. They're kind of Christians that maybe are like, hey, if we're in the wrong, remember it's a rich, rich and prosperous city. Hey, if we're in the wrong, how come we're so rich? 
If God is really unhappy with us, how come we're prospering so much? Isn't that a sign of God's blessing on our life that we're kind of doing really well? If God was unhappy with us, we wouldn't be doing so well, right? And they also had, they were also like full of like spiritual gifts. So you'd go to a service like this and there'd be all kinds of people like speaking in tongues and people who were like prophesying and stuff. And they thought because they were prophesying and there was so much of these spiritual gifts going on, they thought that they were super mature. Like, of course we're mature. People prophesy in church service. I remember uh, years ago when I first came into church, this is, man, this is, I don't know how long I've been a Christian at this point, like 20 years or something. Came in, came in kind of through the, the ground floor, right? Many of you know, like, I've told the story a little bit before, but came in through the street. Like, I was actually on the street for a while and ended up getting into programs. And I was in, like, a Christian discipleship program, like a street-level thing. So I shared, I lived in a house with, like, 25 other guys, and a lot of us were, like, either ex-cons or former drug addicts or people trying to get their lives together or crazy people or whatever. And I was, I was in there in this program, and we got brought along as a Christian discipleship. We'd, like basically get put into a, a van and driven all around like the, what was the Southern California, all around the Southern California area, going to all these different church services and all these different teachings and stuff. And they just drove us wherever they wanted to take us. And I remember we used to go to this pretty famous uh, church and it was like a very, like charis- very, very charismatic church. And I was like very street level still. We'd go to these, they'd have like these big conferences and it was like the prophetic conferences. And I was like, okay, we'll see what this is about. And so this might ruffle some feathers, but this is, this is the truth of me as a street-level guy back in the day who had just come to know the Lord, right? Going to these, like, prophetic conferences and these conferences, and, man, it was crazy because I'd, I'd walk in there, I, would, I didn't know anything, and it would be like everybody in the room, we're talking like 2,000 people, it's like everybody's, like, screaming in tongues and, and, and falling over and, and, and running all over, jumping up on the chairs and stuff. It was, it was wild. This place was very wild. People... People start talking about, I'll never forget, like this dude run by me and he's like prancing and he's like, spirit of the monkey. And he jumps up on a chair and I was like, spirit of the monkey. <laughs> and this person over there is laying down and somebody informs me, that's the python spirit. He's laying down. I was like, the python spirit, spirit of the monkey. <laughs> and, and after a while, you know, we, uh, we, we were a program, right? So they would, they would give us free admission to these conferences and we had, to work, we had to work the parking lot. So we had to like work the parking lot and then we'd come inside and we'd get great seats at these like several thousand people, uh, you know, prophetic or spiritual conferences. And so we'd be like in the front rows, like, and I'm brand new. I didn't even know what was going on. And I remember sitting down next to this kid. Uh, th- I don't know, like the parent bought him, a, bought him a seat, but I ended up sitting down next to him and he just looks at me and he deadpans to me. I didn't know anything. He just deadpans to me super slow. Looks like this, turns to look me in the face and he says, I see demons and angels. The angel has a sword in his mouth and he's flying over the stage. And I was like, children of the corn, get away from me. <laughs> I didn't know. I didn't know. Maybe, maybe, you know, maybe, maybe some of that stuff is right. I don't want to like, I can't, I can't judge people's heart motives, right? But I just know as me coming in very street level, not really knowing, not really understanding, it seemed like, and I would say now 20 years later, I would seem, it would seem like some of that stuff was like kind of out of order, out of order. It's like, and everybody's speaking in tongues and everybody's got a word and everybody's kind of clamoring to get to the front. Listen to me, listen to me, I have a word. Or, 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 or listen to me, listen to me. Spirit of the monkey. Like, I didn't know. And in that, in that moment, like, even 20 years later, I would say, like, that particular instance was probably out of order. It was probably out of order. And, and what you get here, what you'll even get here later in these books that Paul writes to, to the Corinthians, there was a lot of that going on. There was, like, spiritual gifts, but it was out of order. So these guys thought they had it all together. They were wealthy. They were healthy, wealthy, and wise, if you will. They were very mature, supposedly, and they were giving Paul all kinds of problems. In fact, our boy Paul was kind of taking it on the chin here because Paul wasn't that great of a speaker, according to them. Paul actually wasn't like, he wasn't an entertaining enough speaker for some people in Sin City. He just wasn't. There's this other guy, Apollos. They're, again, they're on the same team. I don't think Apollos was feeding into these divisions. But we'll see the, the, the uh, comparison here from Scripture. This is Apollos. It says that he was an eloquent speaker. He had been taught, verse 25, the way of the Lord, and he taught others about Jesus with an enthusiastic spirit and with accuracy. So this guy could speak. He was a polished speaker. And sometimes you get people, like, you get people who who spend all kinds of time learning how to public speak, and they can 
they can start to learn how to take a moment like that. And they know for anybody whose like mind is wandering, they can build a little pause into what they're saying and it'll draw people back. Some people do this. They'll, they'll, they'll give you like the, look at me now, look at me now. And everybody kind of returns to them, right? Some people know how to like start real slow and a, and a real quiet moment where they're trying to make their point and then they'll bring their voices up a little louder and then they'll bring it up louder over the top because they know how to use their voice. They know how to public speak. They know how to use their hands and their body. They know if they're speaking at a, an event for 10,000 people, they know they gotta be this big. But if they're speaking at a small event, they gotta be this big. People study how to public speak. And back then in Sin City, they really wanted to be entertained, some of these people, by their speakers, even if it was speaking the gospel. They wanted that baptism water slide, you know what I'm saying? So Apollos, he was good. It's not that he was a bad guy. He just was a, a polished public speaker. And this was going to cause the Corinthians problems later on down the line because when these false teachers end up coming in, they're also very good public speakers. In fact, they're so entertaining that even though they're speaking about a different Jesus and a different gospel, the Corinthians are still there listening to him because, man, this guy's a great speaker. Paul's going to write about it right here. He says, I don't consider myself, these are the words of Paul, I don't consider myself inferior in any way to these super apostles. Ah, I was incorrect. You said you happily put up with whatever anybody tells you, even if they preach a different Jesus than the one that we preach. You happily put up with it. As long as they get a little song and a dance for you and they know how to like land a joke or two, you'll listen to whatever they say. Even if they preach a different Jesus than the one we preach or a different kind of spirit than the one you received or a different kind of gospel than the one that you believed. He goes on, he says, but I don't consider myself inferior in any way to these super apostles that teach this stuff. I may be unskilled as a speaker. Right, Paul's saying, maybe I'm not as skilled as some of these other guys. Maybe I don't have the flash and the pop. But I'm not lacking in knowledge. We have made this clear to you in every possible way, he says. Paul, the spiritual father, the one who planted that church in Corinth, wasn't a good enough speaker for some of them. Maybe he also didn't fit the mold of what a successful person would look like according to those very successful outwardly Corinthians. They knew all about worldly success, and Paul didn't show worldly success with what he showed in his life. Paul, actually, he didn't have money at all. That seems like Paul didn't have money. He didn't have the earthly recognition and the praises of men. He didn't have the accolades. It actually says that he was homeless. We're going to see here in a second that he was dressed sometimes in rags, and these proud Corinthians couldn't seem to be willing to humble themselves to follow a guy that was sometimes cold and sometimes hungry and sometimes thirsty and sometimes homeless. That was a bridge too far for these Corinthians that kind of had it all together. The pride of the Corinthians couldn't handle the humility of Paul. So we see that Paul's going to hit back at these guys with a little bit of sarcasm. He's going to hit back at them here. So 1 Corinthians 4, he says, already you guys have all that you want. Already you've become rich. Look at you. You've already arrived. You have begun to reign. And that without us apostles. Great job, guys. I wish, how I wish that you really had begun to reign so that we might also reign with you. It's like, it's like you guys have arrived. Fantastic. But us apostles... Well, too bad we couldn't be there and have arrived with you. He says, for it seems to me that God has put us apostles on display at the end of the procession like those condemned to die in the arena. And this is like a, this is like a, a little bit of a flashback to victory parades. Like you'd go in and you'd conquer a city with your army. You'd conquer a city and then you'd return to your home city and it would be like a victory parade returning to your home city. And first would be like all your soldiers and, and all your soldiers are like returning to their city where they're from victorious and people are cheering, yeah. 
behind the soldiers would be all the treasures that you took from that city that you conquered, all their treasures and their gold and all this fancy stuff. And people would be carrying all their gold and their treasures and their art or whatever. They would be behind the soldiers and people were like, yeah. And then last would be the prisoners of war. And they'd be being led at the end of this procession, being led and they're being chained up. There were countries, there were nations back then, they were ruthless. They actually would pierce your nose and attach a chain to your nose to the, to the soldiers that were bringing you in. So you'd be led by the nose in as a prisoner of war. And you would go into the arena in front of the home crowd. And again, the home crowd would be cheering for their soldiers and cheering for all the treasure that they're showing off that they captured. And then booing and jeering all of those prisoners of war. And eventually they would be put to death in front of them while all those people cheered. <clears throat> Paul is saying that's what it is like. It seems like that for us apostles. So you guys think you have arrived, but it seems to us that we're at the end of this procession and we're doomed to die. He says, we have been made a spectacle to the whole universe to angels as well as human beings. And we forget that this thing that happened here on earth, Jesus coming here, this is not just like a human thing. This is something that was done in view of the angels, that they have seen this. So when Paul is coming in as an apostle being put to death, he's like, this is, this is like a spectacle, not just to humans, but it's even a spectacle to everything in the heavenly. He goes on, he says, we are fools, but you guys are so wise. We're fools for Christ, but you guys are so wise in Christ. He says, we're weak, but you guys are so strong, you Corinthians. He says, you're honored, but we are dishonored. To this very hour, we go hungry, we go thirsty. We're in rags, we're brutally treated. We're homeless, he says. We work hard with our own hands. Back then, if you worked with your hands, that meant you were poor because anybody with rich and with money, they all hired other people to work with their hands for them. Paul's like, yeah, I work with my own hands. Yeah, sometimes we're in rags. Yeah, sometimes we're hungry. Yeah, sometimes we're thirsty. We work hard with our own hands. He says, when we're cursed, we bless. When we're persecuted, we endure it. When we're slandered, we answer kindly. We have become, what, the scum of the earth. The Corinthians were wanting to be the cream of the crop. And Paul is saying, actually, we apostles are the scum of the earth. It says, the garbage of the world right up to this very moment. See, everywhere Paul was going, many places that he went, he was facing an uphill battle and persecution, preaching about Jesus Christ, and he would face violence often. We know, we know that there was a time where he was actually brought to, to the outskirts of the city and he was stoned with stones. People threw them at him because they couldn't handle him. They didn't want him there. And they beat his body with these stones and he collapsed into a heap and they thought he was dead. So they leave and then he gets back up and he moves on to the next city and he plants another church in the next city. But that was not getting beat up, getting chased around, getting made fun of, being homeless. That was not the Corinthians' idea of what success looked like. But Paul's like, you guys got it all together, apparently. What are we doing wrong? You guys got it all together. We're out here suffering as fools for Christ. Does that make sense to you, carnal Corinthians? You guys think you're above that. So Paul tells them, do not be deceived. Don't deceive yourselves. If you think you're wise by the standards of this age, I think before I was a Christian, I totally thought I was wise. I thought I, thought I was like pretty smart. I thought I was reading all these theories and reading all these complicated in my mind books. And I really, really thought that I was, I was something. I thought I was smart. And I thought church, honestly, dead seriously, I thought church people were dumb. I was the one telling my Christian friends, oh, it's so cute. You believe in a fairy tale and you go and worship like the spaghetti monster or whatever on a Sunday morning. You've never seen him. You don't know what he looks like. Is he really speaking to you? Are you not having like a, a little schizophrenic episode? I was telling my friends that. I thought I was smart. I thought I was wise. And Paul says, if any of you think you're wise by the standards of this age, you should become fools for Christ so that you might actually become wise. I saw, a, uh, I saw a video, this is, this is like, I don't even know if this was a coincidence, but this is just like maybe two days ago, three days ago. There's a video of Elon Musk. It has nothing to do with his politics or how, what you think about him as a person. 
but Elon Musk was talking, and he's like a smart guy, right? Like, you have to give him credit. He, he, he pioneered a lot of AI stuff, a lot of rocketry stuff. This dude is a smart, by our human standards, right, the wisdom of this age, he's a pretty wise guy. And he was talking about how he grew up a cultural Christian. He was, the whole interview was like a little clip. He's like, I consider myself a cultural Christian, he said. He says, I grew up in church. He says, I, we're, we're Anglican. I would go to church on Sunday mornings. I, I, went to, I went to children's church. You know, I'm a cultural Christian. He's like, some of them stories that they told back then in, in church, he's like, I don't know about them. Uh, they kind of seem like they're silly or whatever, but I'm a cultural Christian. They kind of seem like they're silly. They kind of seem like they're, I, I mean, I've been there. If you're wise by the standards of this age, you should become fools. That earthly wisdom. Back then it was about the philosophers, right? This was in Greece. Corinth is in Greece. Only, only a couple generations before you had the big ones like Plato and Socrates and Aristotle. This was all about wisdom and stuff. Nowadays we have the Elon Musks and the Jeff Bezos and the Bill Gates, these like tech genius guys who pioneer things like AI. They pioneer things like automation or robots, but they don't give a thought really to God because that stuff is all beneath them. Those are just some silly stories about some silly stuff that they teach kids that don't know any better in Sunday school. The idea of God coming to earth and dying for their sins when we're wise in our own eyes, that seems ridiculous. That seems absolutely ridiculous at best. But I think God does that on purpose because in the highest of men's wisdom, they cannot find God. They're so smart. They can figure out how to get to the moon or to Mars, but they can't figure out. They can't figure out God. God needed to reveal himself to us. He does reveal himself to us. He has revealed himself to us. Jesus says it in Matthew 11. He says, I praise you, Father, because you have hidden these things, this revelations of God. You have hidden these things from the wise and the learned, but you have revealed them. You have revealed them to like little children. Some translations say babes, little babies. Because some people who are too wise in their own eyes, they don't have time for this nonsense about some guy who's spent three days in the grave and arose from the dead. So God came to the lowly. That's why his disciples were technically like the lowly of society. It's like the fishermen and the losers, right? The people that didn't really have that outward appearance of success. And Paul is trying to remind these guys, it's not about the outward appearance of success. God doesn't judge by outward appearance, does he? So he's hitting them with the wisdom of this world is foolishness in God's sight. As it is written, he catches the wise in their craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise are futile. Because you maybe can, you maybe can invent all these amazing technologies. You can maybe be the most polished and wise speaker. You can invent rocketry and AI and automation. You can invent things that, that change the trajectory of the world. And you can have extra houses and fancy cars and private planes and servants and all these things. But what good does it do you if you gain the whole world but lose your soul? Proverbs says, there's a way that seems right to a man, but the end of the way is death. So Paul's had enough. He's like, no more boasting about human leaders. All things are yours. Whether it's Paul or Apollos or Cephas or whatever, he goes on and says some crazy stuff. Whether it's the world or life or death or the present or the future, all of these things are yours. They actually belong to you. When you know the Lord... Death actually is a way to usher you into the Lord's presence. Through earthly eyes, it's like, yeah, of course, death is a tragedy, and obviously, but if you know the Lord, you know where you're going, and you enter into the glory, death almost becomes a servant. All things belong to you. Don't say, oh, I'm of, I'm of Paul or Apollos, or I'm of Stephen Furtick. I'm of Pastor Randy or Pastor Eric. Those are my guys. If anything, we belong to you as servants, Servants. Paul says it. He says, this is how you ought to regard us, as servants of Christ. 
and as those who are entrusted with the mysteries that God has revealed. Even if somebody's smart, even if somebody is preaching or teaching and they give you something that you never heard before and you go and you tell your friends, you're like, wow, I never realized that this is what that was talking about in the scriptures. That guy's really got a gift. Even if that person has a gift, it's not like they figured out God. It's because God revealed those things to one of his servants. God has revealed. And he says, Paul says, now it is required that those who have been given a trust must prove faithful. But he says, but I care very little if I'm judged by you or by any human court. He says, indeed, I don't even judge myself. I don't really care what you think of my motives because you can't see what's in my heart. I remember years ago, I, I, I've been doing like the, this like kind of transition prayer moment thing. I've been doing it for, for many years at this point. And I used to do it at my former church. Probably did it for like six or seven years there. And I remember after doing it for, for several years there, I was helping one day in kids' church, and I was on a ladder. I was, like, putting up Christmas decorations or something. There's people milling around, and this, this lady and, her, and I were having small talk, and she's like, hey, can I ask you a question real quick? I was like, yeah, sure. She thought she had a zinger for me. I didn't know. She goes, tell me, why does your voice change whenever you pray? And I was like, what? Why does my voice change whenever I pray? Like, that's such a weird question. But then in the moment, I was like, this lady's this lady's actually accusing me in a way like of being fake because I come out and I pray, but my voice changes and like, like, is this what she's asking me? Like, am I, am I fake? Like, why else would you ask that question? Then I'm thinking like, well, do other people think that I'm like fake when I pray? Does my voice actually change when I pray? I know my voice changes when I talk to babies. I'm like, hey baby, what's up? But like when I pray to God, maybe? I don't know. And having been from the streets, like that's something that like is, is very difficult for me because I always... When I was on the outside of the church, I always thought church was for people who were fake. So when I came into the church, I was like, I do not want to be fake. I don't want to be. I was, of course, judging people's motives without actually knowing what was going on in their heart. But to me, I was like, oh, the church is full of fake people. So I try very hard to try to be authentic and try to even behind, like, there's a little curtain here. And we stand on the other side of this curtain sometimes. And before it's time to come out, it's like, Lord, that I don't want to come out there and be slick. I don't want to come out there with, like, a smart thing to say, even if it's a spiritual sounding thing to say. I don't want to come out and try to, like, seek the praise of the people. Lord, I just want to go out there and be faithful to you, Lord, that you would give me the words to say, Lord, no matter what, God, that your will be done in the name of Jesus. And that's it. That's it. So is this person asking me, like, like, why does your voice change when you pray? I don't know. I don't know. But I do know that I can't let that stuff, like, affect me. You know, that person can't see my heart. I had a guy last week. It's so funny. I had a guy last week tell me, you know what? The first time he preached, I didn't like you. I was like, well, that's great. <laughs> Sometimes I don't like me either. I get it. <laughs> but we're humans. I do that to other people sometimes. I do that to other people. We're humans. That's how it works. So Paul says, I care very little if I'm judged by you or any human court. I don't even judge myself. But he does say this. He says, my conscience is clear. I don't think that I'm doing anything wrong. I think my motives are okay. But even my thinking of what's in my heart doesn't really count for anything because it's the Lord who actually is going to judge me. Because sometimes we do things and even our heart might have motives that our own eyes can't see. You go, like, help out a neighbor. You go and you do a good work. And it's like, are, are we doing that to be the light of the world and to help people? Or are we sometimes doing that with mixed motives? Like, I hope somebody saw me do that. <laughs> we do that stuff. But ultimately, ultimately, it's the Lord that knows what's going on in our hearts. It says, therefore, judge nothing before the appointed time. Wait until the Lord comes. He will bring to light what is hidden in darkness. And he will expose the motives of the heart. At that time, each will receive their praise from God. So when speakers are up on stage, it's like, are we, are we, are we saying things because we want to seem smart? Are we saying things because we want to be intelligent, seem intelligent? Are we, are we doing this out of pride? What are, what are our motives? But then... If Paul was writing to this church, and obviously we're not Corinth, but if he was writing to this church, what would he write about us here in this place? Would he be asking us about our hearts and our motives? Would he ask us things like, hey, when you come to church, are you also relying a little bit too much on being entertained? 
for you when you come to church? Is it about having like the perfect, is it about the songs that you like, first of all? And if the songs are being played that you don't like, you're not gonna offer your worship to God as if those songs are written and performed for you? What is going on in your hearts? Is it all about appearance and what things look like? Is it only appropriate to worship when the sound is perfect, when the lights are awesome? Who is it that we follow? Are we following Christ? Are we following tradition or or man? Are we in church because we've always come to church and because our parents went to church and our grandparents went to church? So it's just a long line of people who have always gone to church and you might be there and it might look like you're in church and it might look like that you're a church person and whatever, but inside there is nothing because the heart does not spend even a hot second thinking about the Lord while they're in church. It's just checking a box. I just do it because I've always done it because I'll always do it because I've always done it. There's, I've been in church a long time at this point, man. There's plenty of people that come to church. They're only here because somebody in the morning is like, we're going to church. I'm like, oh, man. Not again. Didn't I just go like last three months ago? <laughs> I get it. <laughs> I get it. Are we like those Corinthians that think that we have it all figured out? I'm too good for this message today. Where's the meat? Where's the deep teachings? This is silly kid stuff. How about do we make time for God? Do we seek God first? Sometimes it's it's terrible. Like I think about, sometimes I hate that the phone tells you how much time that you spend on it in a day. It's like 100,000 hours and I spent eight minutes with God. Like, great. But do we spend our time with God? Do we prioritize him? What what would Paul be telling us? You are the man. Thank you so much. Should I blow my nose? I know, man. It's bald guy problems. I'm telling you. I was like, should I use a sock or something? I don't know. The Lord knows hearts. He reads hearts. I'm convinced. I'm actually convinced that someday we're going to get to heaven and there's going to have been a book in a way written in a way about each and every one of our hearts and all the motives of all the things that we've ever done. Even if we're doing good for somebody, it's like all those motives in the times that we say things to people and and they're like, hey, what'd you say? And you're like, oh, I didn't mean it like that. But there's there's a little book that's going to be like, yes, you did. (laughs) And it's funny, but I'm I'm totally serious. Like, I actually think that's going to happen. I think that's going to happen because the Bible says that every heart will be laid bare. And we just read it. What was hidden in darkness is going to be brought to the light. It's going to expose the motives of the heart. That is coming. That is actually going to happen. That's why, that's why the Lord says, oh, people come to the Lord, and he's like, depart from me, I never knew you. And they're like, well, I, we said, Lord, Lord, and didn't we do all these things in your name? And didn't we prophesy? And didn't we do all this stuff? And the Lord is going to look at them and be like, it was never in your heart. It was always for the praise and approval of man. That was 100% for you, and it had nothing to do with me. Depart from me, I never knew you. That's how he sees the motives of the hearts. So what are our hearts at? Where are our hearts at today? He doesn't judge based on appearances. He sees deeper than that. And we're going to have communion today. And there's a, there's a verse here in the communion verses from the same book, 1 Corinthians. And Paul says it like this. He says, everybody ought to examine themselves before they eat the bread and drink the cup. Examine yourselves. Look into your heart and say, do I have something that I'm holding against somebody? Is there like unforgiveness towards somebody in my life that I need to pray about now before I take this bread and this cup? Is there a bitterness? Is there sin or something unresolved inside of me? Examine yourself before you eat the bread and drink the cup. And it says something crazy. It says, for those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ, eat and drink judgment on themselves. There are plenty of people who have sipped this little juice and eaten these little crackers but had no idea who Jesus was in their hearts. It doesn't matter about a little bit of juice and a little bit of cracker in your mouth if you don't have Jesus in your heart. Even if you've been doing this for 30 years. I hate to break it to you. It's the truth. 
This is absolutely nothing. It means nothing. Same with baptism. You can be baptized 100,000 times. If you don't have Jesus in your heart, it doesn't mean anything. It doesn't mean anything. So where are you today in your heart? This is not something that your neighbor can answer for you. This is not something that your mom or your wife or your husband or your parents can say. Where are you at right now in your heart? Examine your hearts because we're going to take communion. And do you recognize, in a way, the foolishness of God, the body and blood of Christ given for us? This has been given out for like 2,000 years now. Paul took communion. Peter took communion. They sat, the disciples sat around a table and took communion together with Jesus. And it's been happening among all of the Christ followers from generation to generation to generation to generation ever since. Recognize what we're doing here. So if you have never received the Lord, if you know that, And a lot of times people think like, maybe that's like a first or a second time guest maybe hasn't like received the Lord yet. No, there's times, I've been working in the church for a long time. There are times where you see somebody every Sunday for like 10 years and you shake hands and you high five and whatever. They might even serve somewhere like kids church or something. But like 10 years later, that person gives their life to the Lord Jesus from the heart for the first time ever. And we would assume from outward appearances that they did that a long time ago, but the Lord knew and their day finally came. So is today your day? When I go out, I want to go out with a pure heart before the Lord. That's I tried the best that I could. I got up here and made a fool out of myself. I told stories I was uncomfortable telling, and it wasn't hopefully, hopefully, to make myself get some praise from some man and some women. Great job, Randy. You're the best. I want to be a servant of the Lord. And I want to give my life. Paul talks about pouring out his life as an offering. That's not just for preachers and leaders. That's for each and every one of us that's in here. Can you pour out your life as an offering for the Lord? Live your life for God. It all starts with giving your heart truly to Jesus. So I want to make this moment here. This is not a pressure thing. Don't feel pressured if it's not in your heart. I always say it's not about speaking it just with your mouth. There has to be the mouth and the heart together. You could teach a parrot. I almost always say this. You could teach a parrot to pray a prayer and receive Jesus verbally, right? But it doesn't mean that's like a Christian parrot. That's just a parrot. So if you're ready, you want to receive the Lord in your heart. The Lord sees it right now. You are fully exposed in your heart before the Lord, the eyes of the Lord right now.